Uh, next speaker is a weight loss and pleasure expert. Uh, pleasure expert, exactly. She's the founder of the Jenna Wellness Center in New York City. She's been featured in Glamour, Pilates Style, and on Discovery Health Channel. She is definitely a modern day pleasure stuff. One who believes that the art of pleasure is sacred and something that is critical to our health, our wellness, and life. Jenna is um, someone who, you know, you just look at her and the way she walks and she just oozes pleasure. Um, it is absolutely, positively hypnotizing to watch her dance and move and just play through life. Please welcome our great friend, Jenna LaFlax.
speak today, I'm going to talk about a larger, a broader unburdening that is our separation from the knowing the pleasure of sacred. So, why do my ancestors believe in the pleasure of sacred? Well, it's on the back of the belief that life itself is sacred. That our participation in life, this existence, this reality is sacred. That we're not waiting until we're afterlife, we're not waiting until we die, we're not waiting until we're enlightened, until we escape birth and great death. At one of the day we'll be sacred, but now we are sacred. This is it. And they believe pleasure was sacred because through pleasure you are contacting life itself through your senses. And it's that kiss, that direct contact with reality itself and the enjoyment of it, oh, that is so honoring to the divine. How better to honor life, to honor the divine by enjoying it. This is the belief of my ancestors. And although at the time this was so shocking to me, you know, that's because our culture has taken a path away from this understanding. So we can broadly think of cultures as the, uh, a more on a dominated model or more on a partnership model. And through the passage of time, the partnership model where we partner with life changed and there became an influence that came in with monotheism, where there was a dominator model, where the body stopped being holy, where sex stopped being pure, where the mind, where agape, abstract, impartial love, became superior to eros, passionate love, desiring love. And so there was a split. And so I was raised to believe, you know, heaven is holy and earth is sinful. We're born of original sin. And who caused that, by the way, is Eve, the woman. Women, I was, believe, I was raised to believe in our culture. Even if we, in our individual families, did not get this specific message, woman is evil. And I imagine many of us here came from very liberal backgrounds and different uh, you know, families of thought that didn't have this there, but it's in the air. Even if we think we don't carry the burden of those beliefs that you know, woman is the cause of sin, Pleasure and sex are the cause of sin. It's in us more than we realize. So, you know, the religion I was raised in says that sin, that Eve, that woman, um, is the cause of original sin, and that we women bear that guilt going forward. And so, quote here an early church leader, Tertullian, who told women, You are the devil's gateway. Do you know that every one of you is Eve? The sentence of God and your sex lives on. The guilt of necessity lives on, too. This is the kind of miseducation that we got, the misinformation that we're here to turn around. Because what happens there, we know this. So women, we don't trust ourselves. Men, then, we know they trust us. And then we don't get along. And we, the people, miss out. And, um, the, you know, some dominating forces who can take advantage of us being separate from ourselves, separate from our instincts, come on the show. So there became in, in religion this split between body and the sacred, where the mind was holy, the body was dirty. And that's how I was raised to to really believe that and to have a lot of shame about my body and to really hate my body. And that is epidemic in our culture. And I imagine privately, each one of you has at some time in your life really had that struggle with loving your body. So the good news is it wasn't always that way. There was a time when we believed in the sacredness of life. We trusted the innocent impulses of our bodies towards the sensual. Because that's what's going on here. Even if the mind is like, oh, should I think this? Should I think that? Your body hasn't changed. Your body is still that organism that goes, hmm, pleasure, promise of safety, life, goodness. Oh, pain, threat, danger. Be careful, be aware. And what happens is that when we are, we have our bodies moving towards this, and our mind not knowing what to make of it, then we are split. We are out of our power. And we can bring them back together with the narrative that explains why these things are good. 
then we can be whole again. So there was a time when this was a, a belief. There was a time when sex was worshipped. There was a time when our sex organs, the sacred vulva, the phallus, were honored objects on the altar. You know, think of Tantra, where they have even, you know, not that less than a thousand year old temples where you see, you know, holy man went in prayer in front of a giant vulva. Um, we have um, in history an ecstatic mystic called Lala, a female from Kashmir, who is famous for dancing in ecstasy naked and described with the poem Lala dancing with nothing, wearing nothing but air. So we have cultures where this has been honored and we can return to them. We don't have to be strappings, reverence, for pleasure from nothing. We just need to look back a little bit back further in time and we find this. We find that in every ancient culture, there was some version of what we call heroes gamos, which is the sacred marriage, which is the union, a sexual act, an act of sex, happen in ritual in the temple. So the contrast to sex is dirty, sinful, no, no, don't do that. This is what we do on the high holy days. Everyone gathers around and is blessed by this. We find cultures like ancient Sumer, where there was sex at the temple, and there were at the temple what was described, was described today as the temple prostitute, which is a bit of a clumsy language in, in English because of what we think of a prostitute, but here the temple prostitute was a priestess that the men could come to, to be cleansed, to be purified, to be blessed by ecstasy of pleasure. It said that women before their wedding night would need to serve a night at the temple to as preparation for her wedding, to be there, to receive the men that were coming from war, from pain, from whatever their life circumstances were to receive this. In our culture now, we don't have that anymore. And it's my belief that it's a scar in our culture, it's a scar in our hearts, something missing. We just feel like something's wrong because sex is wrong. And there's an opportunity for each of us to, as we learn about these histories, these ancient histories like this, this temple prostitute, to uh, reclaim a part of ourselves that does find spirituality through sexuality, that does find healing through sexuality, that experiences, um, where we experience ourselves as a healer of others through our sexuality. For me, understanding and integrating the, the archetype of the temple prostitute happened when I was uh, also a teenager, and I learned about the history of Sumer and Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, where the goddess was the feminine of worship. And it really helped me put it into perspective because I, it's like women, it's girls, boys, this culture, we're just thrown into this, like, ah, we're sexual creatures, what are we to talk about? And it's really, you know, it's really damaging to have this much force, this much life force and energy and passion and it has so much to lose that you can't really learn and you can't really understand the legacy of what the heck is going on here. So the bits that I did learn were very healing and to be able to realize that um, what I experienced as that, that act that was so ecstatic, that was separate from achieving something, was actually both healing for my partner and healing for me, was deeply believing and felt True. Okay. No. So pleasure, pleasure is sacred. Why pleasure is sacred? There's many misunderstandings about pleasure. Because it's so taboo, we haven't had the proper education. And one popular misunderstanding is the understanding between pleasure and addiction, what I would call true pleasure and counterfeit pleasure. So true pleasure, it answers yes to the question, because this could be pleasure now, in an hour, in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. We can look back through time, we 
wide eyes and you can say, yeah, that, yeah, that was great. Versus counterfeit pleasure, which doesn't answer yes to that. And I'll give an example of myself. Last night, I had a nice dinner, came home, I was a little bit hungry, but most of all, I was nervous about this talk. And I'm like, I'm gonna eat something. So I got the tortilla and the almond butter and chocolate and I rolled it up, tea and I ate it and I was good. And then I'm like, And so I went to the kitchen, and this time I had half one, but I, I ate it. Went to bed late on the full stomach. Woke up this morning to the biggest belly ache. Well, I was like, around my house this morning. And actually, I threw up this morning. <laughs> and that was a lesson in that. I'm like, okay, that was a counterfeit pleasure to go for that second snack at midnight when what I really needed was to get a good night's sleep before this presentation. And just not to be worried about it and like, be caught up in some perfectionist. So we learn from counterfeit pleasure. Counterfeit pleasure is not for naught. It's an experience, we're learning. I think trial and error is the only way to learn these things. Pleasure requires that you're present. All the great spiritual traditions talk about being present, meditation, prayer. And you can only have pleasure when you show up through your senses and you're actually smelling, actually tasting, actually seeing, actually Feeling. So it's a real litmus test for being present. And being present is hard. Speak for myself. I find it incredibly challenging. And it's just ooh, amazing just to disappear and to have somewhere else that's not here. But what I mentioned is that it is here. And certainly bridging being here with the ability to be somewhere else that brings back to being here. Connect the dots. The discipline of pleasure is the discipline of being present. It's meditation in disguise. Present is a, a pleasure is also only possible when you are accountable. Meaning, one of my favorite quotes from the teacher, Mama Gina, will say, pleasure is the highest form of responsibility. Meaning we think, oh, pleasure is going to come from the outside. It's going to happen to us, and isn't that great? But actually, no. Pleasure happens when you show up, and you create it, and you get clear on how you are the creator of your reality. You're not a victim just hoping that you're going to get dished out of pleasurable life, but you are the funder of that existence itself. Pleasure teaches us to know ourselves. It makes us an authority. Because no one but you can know what gives you pleasure. I can give you suggestions, I can give you pointers, maybe even some blind spots where you don't realize there's pleasure available to you that I know that you don't yet, but ultimately you are your pleasure authority. And pleasure requires that you know yourself. It requires ruthless honesty. I have a quote here I'd love to read. By poet Audrey Lord, hero of mine, who says, Why the erotic is so feared and so often relegated to the bedroom alone when it is recognized at all? It's for once we begin to fully to feel deeply all the aspects of our lives, and we begin to, to demand from ourselves and from our life's pursuits that they feed us in accordance with our deepest erotic knowledge and joy. This is a grave responsibility project, projected from within each of us, not to settle for the convenient, the shoddy, the conventional, the expected, or the merely safe. So basically, once you're in touch with pleasure, once you're in touch with your desire, you know when it's not the real thing. Pleasure requires a big perspective, uh, like a wide vision. It's not just an instantaneous thing. It requires a greater wisdom and being open to seeing pleasure for the first time. So, so how, how can you get into it? How can you start? Where do you start? Where I suggest starting is with the practice of what I call cultivating your erotic innocence. So your erotic innocence is the part of you that is that natural instinct towards pleasure, sensual, sexual, erotic. And it arises from your body, which is the part of you that existed throughout the course of, that came to exist throughout the course of evolution before your mind developed to come online. 
come online to judge it as right, wrong, shameful, good, bad, and anything like that. This pride that is innocent by nature of it arising before even the mind is there to give it a label as anything else. It's that part of you that knows. Do I like it? Or do I not like it? And often we're just tuned out of that. And that's what I want to invite you to pray as a practice. Just being aware of that part of your, yourself. Is this opening me or is this contracting me? And trusting that part of you. Trusting that it's sacred, it's a divine connection with life itself. Now that may seem a bit scary to be you're following the compass of your erotic innocence, and I invite you to protect your erotic innocence with what I call your erotic wisdom, which is your heart's knowing, which gives context to your desire and will help you know when is the right time just to feel that desire and when is the right time to act on it. Same with your erotic intelligence, which is the thinking mind, looking down and protecting and knowing when is the right time, the safe time, for this vulnerable, pure, innocent part of yourself to come out and play. In our culture, we made this switch. We made this separation through the early church of virgin and whore. And uh, the date here is in uh, 19, uh, 591 CE that Pope Gregory declared Mary Magdalene whore. She was a strong, independent, highly gifted, feminine spiritual leader who traveled alone and hung out with men. And she may have been a temple prostitute. She may have been an erotic priestess, historically, but she may not have been. She may just have been a woman who was you know, at peace with her own sexuality, and she was brought down. She was labeled a whore. She was thrown in the gutter. And so we have Mother, May, Mother Mary, Holy, for separation. And I want to bring them back as whole for you. What, where, where they come together is that to be a, a sacred prostitute, to be one who's in touch with the sacredness of your sexuality, for yourself and for others, takes being a virgin. And by that I mean the definition where the virgin is like a virgin forest, like a virgin nature untouched. It knows itself. It knows its truth. And in knowing yourself so deeply and knowing your purity, you can open yourself to share love with another and to even be judged, even be ridiculed by what other people may think of that. Because you are so pure and you know yourself. So this is my invitation to you to allow pleasure to be sacred in your life, to be a priority, to be a spiritual path, to be something that teaches you to get to know your erotic innocence and to protect your erotic innocence against uh, dangers that may take advantage of that sweet, pure innocence. To trust that you can protect it and you can allow that part of you to thrive. And I um, have a prayer. Thank you for the moon, the sun, the skies, and the seas. Thank you for the 
the winds, the rains, the oceans, and lakes. Thank you for all the love you receive from friends, loved ones, and strangers every day. Thank you, sacred pleasure, for all the insights, the wisdom you give to us today. May it stay with us forever. Thank you for taking such good care of us on our journey on this planet. Thank you for Scott. Thank you for Sasha. Thank you 